and we've done a great job laying up for the next speaker, which is Dario, who's online, joining us from Sydney. So I hope you're there, Dario. Yep, thanks. So I'll just share my screen. There we go. Okay. All right, well, good afternoon, um, everyone. And um, today I'd like to tell you about some uh, functionality and usability improvements that we've recently made to classify R in version three. So before I tell you about that, um, for those people in the audience who don't know about the package, um, I'd like to tell you about the key concepts. So it's a predictive modeling framework designed with bioinformatics data in mind. So it formalizes modeling into uh, four stages. Uh, the first stage is data transformation. And unless this uses information about um, the class of the sample, this is typically done outside of the framework, but there are some data transformations which also depend on the class. So this can be done inside of the cross-validation. The second stage is feature selection. And the third stage is model training. And the fourth stage is test set prediction. So there are a range of popular general purpose modeling algorithms such as SVM as shown by Yue, as well as omic specific ones. Uh, for example, you could calculate um, the differences in abundance values between uh, binary gene interactors that you've obtained from a protein-protein interaction database, for example. And um, users can also contribute their own via uh, Git pull requests. So the kinds of models that are included uh, capture differences in three broad categories. Typically, uh, when people look for differences, they look for difference in means. Um, but we've thought that also differences in variability and differences in distributions are also important. So in the um, graphic on the right side of screen, um, at the top, I'm showing differential expression. And this is what you would get if you did your typical um, uh, t-test from Lima or your um, likelihood ratio test from EDGAR, for example. And uh, the vertical dashed lines are the mean of each class. And we see that these two classes have different means. Um, but in the uh, two illustrations below, there's differential variability, the second one. And what we can see is that the red and the blue class have the same mean, but the red class has a wider spread. And in the tails of this distribution, um, there's predictive power in the values of this particular feature. And similarly for this illustration of differential distribution, you have two class means which are quite similar, but um, in one class you have basically one peak in the blue class, and in the red class you have two peaks, and there are regions of this distribution which are quite informative for predicting which um, class a sample comes from. So you can think of these two um, other categories as perhaps gene dysregulation of some sort. Something's gone a bit haywire in the gene expression. Um, and um, after that modeling is done, there's a variety of performance evaluation functions which all accept a, a classifier result S4 object uh, that's created by the modeling process or a list of such objects. So now to tell you what's, what's new in version three in a concise little list. So previously, um, as you could guess from the name, classifier only worked for classification, but um, it's been overhauled so that all of the um, functions will work for survival data, which also includes censoring, of course. Um, as UA um, hinted at before, there's multi-view data modeling that greatly, greatly simplifies multi-omics data integration and predictive evaluation of it. Um, there's model agnostic variable importance, which um, works by leaving out one variable at a time and uh, building a model and seeing how it performs. Models um, capture um, 
for all of these, um, these new models, which we've also included, such as um, uh, random survival forests and extreme gradient boosting, both of those are new wrappers. Um, there's a cross-validate convenience function that simplifies parameter settings compared to run tests. So now you only need to specify a character keyword, whereas before you had to specify a um, S4 params object. And what we found um, in practice was that um, honors students and PhD students uh, weren't so excited about a uh, BioC parallel params object as uh, say Martin Morgan or perhaps Aaron Lunn are. There's also um, adaptive sampling, which um, helps you model if there's uncertainty in the class labels. Um, we've built in robustness against feature names that don't follow our rules. So once you get away from the um, gene expression sort of fields to more um, exotic data types like metabolomics, you find that there's a lot of um, slashes, colons, brackets, and asterisks in the feature names. Um, and many of the parameters for the functions that we um, provide now have a value of auto for the um, parameter. So that will mean, um, I'm, I don't want to think about this function too much. Uh, just pick a reasonable value of the parameter for me, please. So to give you a case study of the new classify R, we're going to apply it to some data from curated TCGA data. So this bioconductor package has collected the process PCGA data um, to help enable the R bioinformatics community to more easily analyze this consortium's data. And uh, they, they published their work in uh, JCO Clinical Cancer Informatics. Um, so we're going to use uh, two different um, omics technologies to find out which omics predictors are most informative of stage three skin melanoma patient prognosis. Um, so first what we do is we um, uh, load the data into R using the curated TCGA data function, and that produces a multi-assay experiment for us. So what I've loaded here is um, normalized uh, RNA-seq data and micro RNA-seq data, and we're going to um, compare those two data types. Um, so after a bit more filtering and combining the days to death column with the days to last follow-up column into a single column, which is more the convention in R to have a single column of uh, follow-up times and a single um, column of status uh, censoring times, we get this um, uh, call data for, for our data set, which um, you can see it has the, um, they're all stage three samples. Um, some of them are alive, uh, which is zero, and some of them are dead, which is one, and we have those um, times in a single column. So the, the important new function to know about is cross-validate, which will make your life easier um, compared to the previous run tests. So it allows for the um, direct input of popular bioconductor data containers, such as the multi-assay experiment and the um, data frame from S4 vectors, as well as the old fashioned uh, matrix, the plain data frame and a list of such tabular data. Um, outcome is, could be a, four different things. Um, so it's quite flexible to allow you to um, enter different kinds of data. Um, it can be a, a factor. It could be a name or an index of a column containing a factor. It could be an object of type serve from the survival package. Uh, it could be a pair of column names containing the time and status information. Um, so the default is fivefold cross validation, and we repeat that 20 times. This is important because we want to know uh, not just one um, accuracy or error rate for our cross validation, we want to know the variability in that um, uh, performance metric as we vary uh, how our uh, samples are split into training and test sets um, in different repetitions of that splitting. So the feature selection is based on the p-value ranking of individual features using a fast inflammation um, in C of COX tests. And the choice is made on the top p features using um, resubstitution accuracy, where p ranges from one to 10. Uh, model fitting is uh, using the default, which is the random forest from the Ranger package on CRAN, 
And this is a bit of a newer package on CRAN than the old uh, Retina Forest one. By default, this one can do um, uh, categorical data and it can also do survival data. And we're going to do um, the data combination of the RNA and microRNA just simply by merging them. Um, so you can see here is our cross-validate um, command. So we've got um, our melanoma data, which is a multi-assay experiment data object. Um, and the survival column um, is the one that we're going to look at. Um, then we're going to use um, Cox proportional hazards to test each variable one at a time. And we're going to consider the top one to 10 features and um, use those from each of the assays. And we're going to look at those individually as well as combining them. So uh, the last element of our result object, which is a list is uh, the S4 class classifier result. And it gives you a nice overview of the characteristics of what it's storing inside. So here it's um, used the mRNA-seq and microRNA-seq. Um, this is a cross-validation it's done. This is the merging strategy that it's used. And um, this is a classifier and selection um, method wrappers that it's used. So the performance plot will tell you um, uh, it has a various range of categorical and survival um, performance metrics. So if we just do performance plot cross validated, what we'll get is this um, plot that we see on our um, uh, right side of the screen. So um, on the x-axis, we have different assay names and on the y-axis, we have C index. So the default performance metric is auto, which is balanced accuracy for categorical um, outcome tasks and C index for survival outcome. So it knows from that S4 object that we've done a survival task and it's going to uh, plot C index for us. And on the X axis, um, the default characteristic is auto, which is the most variable characteristic in our characteristics table. And in this instance, it's assay name. So we see here that the microRNA seq data is actually um, the most uh, best performing um, assay. And when we merge the microRNA seq data with the messenger RNA seq data, the performance actually gets a bit worse. So uh, data integration is popular and uh, everyone's trying to do it, but it might not always give you the best um, performance uh, in terms of predicting the uh, test data. Uh, lastly, I would like to tell you about samples metric map. So once we've got some metrics, we might want to know um, which samples are consistently being predicted well and which samples are being predicted inaccurately. Um, so on the x-axis here, we've got samples and on the y-axis here, we've got the assays. Um, and I've just used um, show x label is false because we don't want to plot 160 um, sample labels along the x-axis. And we can see a group of samples here on the left side of the plot, uh, which have quite a high C index. Um, whereas the, um, yeah, so the, when, when they're combined or they're um, predicted by the microRNA, they're not so well predicted. And similarly on the right side of plot here, we've got samples which are better predicted by the microRNA-seq data, but not so well by the messenger RNA-seq data. So a couple of just mentions of ongoing work. So crisscross validate. Um, this is where we have multiple data sets which are measuring the same features and they also have the same set of um, outcomes, um, but they might be generated by different universities in different countries, for example. Um, so to illustrate on the right side here, we might have three uh, data sets uh, that, that have completely um, different sets of samples, but with the same outcome. And we want to train and test on all possible combinations of um, those three data sets. So this is to evaluate um, the performance when you train um, on one data set and predict on another one to see how generalizable your classifier is. So if you um, developed your classifier on a, uh, a data set from an American university, you want to check that it works on a similar data set from an Australian university to see whether your predictions um, are generalizable across uh, countries. 
So this work's inspired by uh, two journal articles. So the first one was um, led by Sarah Jane Schramm and Jean Yang. That was in Journal of Investigative Dermatology in 2012. And the second one is a similar idea, but applied to microRNAs. And that was led by, again, Jean Yang and uh, her student at the time, Kaushila Jayawadana. And that was published in Journal of Investigative Dermatology in 2016. And the current implementation is being put together by Harry Robertson. Uh, lastly, there's the multi-platform precision pathway. And the goal is to construct and optimize a classification decision tree that uses multiple omics assays, which incorporate accuracy and cost into the evaluation. And this is inspired by the multi-step classifier that addresses cohort heterogeneity, um, which was led by Ellis Patrick and Jean Yang and published in OncoTarget in 2017. Uh, this MPPP is being developed by a Andy Tran. Finally, I'd like to um, acknowledge um, uh, a few different groups. So firstly, the Sydney Precision Di Data Science Centre at the University of Sydney. Um, it's a very collaborative place to work at. So there's been lots of suggestions, ideas and bug reports. So thanks to everyone for those. Uh, secondly, the Melanoma Centre of Research Excellence, uh, also at the University of Sydney, and the grant APP1135285 for partially funding this project. And lastly, the Head and Neck Cancer Research Group um, and their Cancer Institute of New South Wales Translational Program Grant for also partially funding this work. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions now. Dario, for a great presentation, do we have questions for Dario? It's great to see plenty of plans there for classifier version four in the pipeline, Dario. Yep. Okay, so it looks like not, but thanks again for a fabulous talk. Thank you. Continued development of classifier, and I encourage everyone to give it a go, download it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, let us know what you find with your data sets.